So, nobody asked, but how does this work? In keeping with this channel's theme of reviewing fantasy anime for fun lessons related to architecture and engineering, I want to dedicate this video to the lurching conglomeration designed in the 2004 Studio Ghibli film Howl's Moving Castle. From here, we'll settle into a discussion on the design and engineering of Howl's House, uh, governing principles, mechanics, and even touch some grass and talk about some real-world parallels. But before getting into it, uh, here's a gentle plug to like and subscribe as those sorts of things are important for growing the community and the conversation. So to begin thinking about the incredible dreams of Hayao Miyazaki, well, first, uh, are these his dreams? Eh, kind of. Uh, although the film is based on a 1980s novel of the same name, the book describes a sullen black castle that levitates by utter magic rather than the fleet-footed amalgamation of Ghibli's design. Even still, an imagined form with bird-like legs supporting a house above was first described in old Slavic folklores of Baba Yaga and replicated throughout history by creative folks all over. With such an over-the-top design, it often operates under the rule of cool, and Howl's home is not really any different. But on this channel, there's no such thing, so first, let's make some general observations about the castle. In the opening sequence, we're introduced to the big waddling turkey passing through the fog against a bucolic backdrop. Aesthetically, it's a funny juxtaposition that this steampunk marvel would find its home, or well, one of them, here. And it's this steampunk, or maybe gas lamp styling, that guides the design. Materially, we're shown steel plates bent and riveted into turrets or round faces, and these meld into brick walls that give way to wood-framed jetties that hang off the side. There are half a dozen exhaust stacks, presumably part of the power system, a few widows watches, and even a metal wing or sail that protrudes off the back, uh, like a turkey. Sorry, I'm hungry. And this behemoth of vernacular architecture is entirely supported by these spindly little legs. Uh, pretty clear its proportions such that we'd have to expect some magical forces at play. And sure enough, uh, eventually when our main character Sophie ventures into the castle, we meet the fire demon Calcifer, who's responsible for its operation. His magical energy quite literally turns the gears and holds this thing together, all from the heart of this surprisingly cramped castle. Even more so, the castle's attributes are tied to Calcifer's well-being and power, and throughout the story we see the castle change and molt from a lurching monster to a small cruiser and even just a walking platform before rising to the sky in a final sequence uh, born anew. But despite its magical nature, the castle does seem to mimic some of the elements of its world. The chimney stacks are seen in the nearby towns as a call to the age of the coal-fired power plant. The metal cladding of the castle also appears similarly on these Great War era ships, and the brick walls look right out of a rustic country home. Technologically, the castle wants to be a part of this world, I'm not trying to go beyond it or revert to some older mysticism. Now, as ambitious engineering-minded folks, let's see just how feasible is this big lurching monster, and I will ask for a little bit of patience uh, as I start this endeavor thinking I was talking about architecture and quickly realize this is more about engineering dynamics, which I'm not as well trained in, but uh, we're going to have some fun with it anyways. Uh, now, obviously, like I mentioned, this castle runs on Calcifer's magic, but I'm curious to know what makes a moving castle need magic. Or to ask it another way, how close could we get to this? And to really get to the heart of it, we'll counterintuitively need to start towards the end of the film with the simplest version of the castle, a walking platform. If we look at the nearly disintegrated platform presented at the end of the film, that instance of Howl's Castle seems rather plausible. The, the only elements are two bird legs powered by some sort of pulley systems at the behest of Calcifer, no doubt, and a simple wooden platform. So to focus on the only available elements, the bird legs appear to be made of a galvanized or rust-resistant metal alloy, with an upper and lower leg which may or may not be telescoping. If they did extend and contract, they could be quite helpful when traversing the mountainous expanse of the wastes. The upper and lower leg are then joined with a couple of ball joints at the ankle and knee, and the joints are shown to have a limited range of motion by the riveted kneecap here. But one issue with ball joints is that they transmit vibrations that can be uncomfortable for passengers, and without any shock-absorbing or suspension systems, uh, Sophie and the gang's ride would have been a bumpy one, and the ball joints would also typically need a collar of sorts to help prevent dirt and debris compromising the movement, so it's a pretty close representation to a real engineered element. But still, there's got to be something else to it. The two-legged platform seems to be lacking something else, like uh, stability, which is a good segue to the next form of the castle, the scuttling head. 
Still working backwards, the second iteration of the castle is shown to us right before the platform case, with this core element that has been rebirthed from the defunct old castle after Calcifer eats Sophie's hair. Hopefully there was some magic to mask the smell. In this form, uh, compared to the platform, it's got twice as many legs, but significantly it's got some real structure sitting on top and gives us a better opportunity to look at the movement dynamics more colloquially known as the gate. The easiest comparison would be a four-legged friend, like a cat or dog, and they typically move themselves in a few different ways. At a walking pace, they'll have three feet planted, with only a split second of imbalance when the back leg and front legs aren't in contact, while they basically trade places. This minimizes impact their joints would need to take, and similarly for the castle. But the second version of Howl's Moving Castle, the scuttling head, isn't really walking. It's what in dog physiologists, or maybe, I don't know, Westminster judges would call a trot. And here the imbalance is kept, while the two diagonal paws are in contact with the ground and trading off for raised legs near simultaneously. And for what it's worth, uh, when your fur friend has the zoomies, it would be the front two and back two that pair along together with a lot of internal momentum transfer that helps keep the balance while motion is going forward. And obviously, there's a lot of nuance to the dynamics of a gait, as far as the motion and transfer of loads through the limbs and joints that I've skipped over. Uh, I'm mostly thinking of the global stability of the system and what the effect would be for the castle's structural materials. When trotting, not only would the whole of the weight need to be resisted by just two legs, but there would be also be an impact associated with the stepping and transfer of feet. Now, I'm sure you've heard your most insufferable engineering friend push their glasses up and refer to walking as controlled falling, but I actually like this phrasing for this discussion, as it helps with the highlighting of the concept of impact loading and an acceleration-based view of forces. For example, in human legs, when running and sprinting, the weight applied to the soles of the feet can be as high as 40 to six times the weight of the person, if only instantaneously. And this is the result of rapid deceleration in the leg speed as it comes into contact with the ground as the only point of contact. So with all this knowledge, let's turn our attention to the main character, the real Howl's Moving Castle. And focusing on the moving part, it seems to walk with the trotting gait, having the diagonal two legs trading off, planting, and moving, which is a bit unique among the four-legged folks and would not just force the two legs alone to resist the weight of the loading, but also have a higher impact than the smooth movements of a cat. Now, granted, one factor that is a bit different, and I think I'm coming in with a brand new sentence here, but a building doesn't have hips. Uh, hips are what help people and animals align their center of mass with their center of contact while in motion. If it weren't for this ability to shift weight, then the control and that controlled falling might just be lost. And that's part of the reason I left the platform case off of the discussion of gait mechanics, since in between steps for the two-legged platform, there would only be one leg of support way over here while the center of mass is in the center. That's real magic. And that's why it's so interesting that Howl's Moving Castle not only moves laterally, but also heaves and breathes as though it were a living animal, perhaps shifting its internal center of mass like a real character, which is absolutely on par for the course for a Ghibli film. <laughs> Could you even imagine Miyazaki animating something so lifeless as a medieval castle made of coal that moves with imperceptible thrusts? To try and bring this concept back into my wheelhouse, uh, even with the near-perfect gate, the occupants of the castle are going to experience some accelerations and likely be not just perceptible, but perhaps even jarring. With each step, the transfer of load from one leg to the next will be catching the falling weight of the imbalanced castle here. Now, this will cause some vertical accelerations and potentially large ones, even if the shock-absorbing system is doing a fantastic job. And there would be some horizontal accelerations as well as the castle lurches forward and back. Miyazaki captures some of this in an early scene with the castle heaving and hoeing while en route to a nearby lake. Uh, typically, building designers, particularly for high-rises, will need to limit the maximum felt accelerations due to one-year and ten-year storms to something like a fraction of a percent of the acceleration due to gravity, which would still be perceptible but likely tolerable. As a bit of an aside, and this might just be headcanon, but I think it's part of the reason for attractions like rotating restaurants. While operating under the guise of giving everyone the best views, the rotation applies a slight centripetal acceleration that can help mask the accelerations due to swaying of the slender towers, uh, tricking the inner ear in a sense while seated and at a heightened awareness. So let's assume Sophie and the gang either all have a bad inner ear or Calcifer is helping out with a bit of magic in that regard. 
While discussing accelerations, it's probably worth mentioning that if these accelerations were large enough, each falling step would essentially be like its own little earthquake, as far as the castle above is concerned, with vertical and horizontal forces that would cause rapid tension and compression changes throughout Howell's castle. Now, that would definitely need Calcifer's help in keeping together, assuming he can stomach it. And for you numbers nerds out there... <gasps> I'm a nerd. Uh, this one's for you. I, I want to get a halfway decent estimate of the load applied on one of the legs to ballpark how large they'd need to be. Now, to do this, uh, let's start by stating a few parameters. First, uh, let's assume Calcifer's magic uh, doesn't help offset gravity. We've kind of been operating under that assumption throughout most of the video to this point, but that would be worth saying out loud. Next, we need to make an assumption about the weight of the castle, which appears to be some mix of steel, brick, wood, stone, and, well, air, uh, where the living spaces are. Then, let's ballpark the volume of the castle, which is pretty tall. How about uh, 100 feet from door to spire, uh, 50 feet across, and 65 feet in depth? Uh, fight me in the comments about it. And it's not quite a box shape, uh, something in between that and an ovoid or a 3D oval, and so we can ballpark the volume at about 250,000 cubic feet, or 6,500 uh, meters cubed, with a weight of 40 million pounds, or 18,500 metric tons. So, each leg, when operating under the gate mechanics described above, would need to support a static weight of one-third of the load, but if we account for the increase in loading due to impact of each step, which we talked about some in a previous video, then each metal leg would more or less need to be able to resist the entire weight of the house above, and the legs would likely need to be much stronger than even that. As metals are prone to strength loss due to repeated loadings called fatigue, think of a paperclip bending back and forth, though the the total weight of 40 million pounds is huge, and the penalty for fatigue effects can cause designs to triple or quintuple in size, so while the most generous visuals depict a several foot wide steel ankle, even the highest grade of steel may not be enough, uh, though that shouldn't stop us from trying. Uh, the big clunker just needs to shed some of that dead weight. Since we're now pretending like Howl's Moving Castle is even vaguely feasible, uh, for the last topic, let's look at some real-world examples of sizable buildings that have actually moved. In the course of all of history, humans have built millions, perhaps billions of buildings, so for the few hundred, maybe few thousand cases that have required a wholesale pickup and move, in that context, it really helps describe how rare the feat is, as though it actually does require some magic, or at least a good reason, and from my research, that seems to usually be the case, whether it's one of the oldest residential houses in England moving to make way for a new road, or a lighthouse being picked up and shoved over due to advancing shorelines. Now, structure relocation doesn't have to be done wholesale. Buildings can be disassembled and rebuilt on a new site, but that obviously isn't how we've been talking about it today. So, when moving a whole house, or castle let's say, the methodology looks like raising the structure by picking it up with hydraulic jacks and placing a wooden or steel cribbing beneath it, like a new foundation. Uh, you either then get it onto a dolly, a flatbed truck, uh, or a railway, and haul it over to its next location. Now for reference, the largest recorded structure to have ever been moved was the house of a famous millionaire in Baku, Azerbaijan that weighed over 18,000 metric tons, which just about matches the guesswork weight of Howell's castle, though it only needed to budge about 10 meters. And lastly, Chinese engineers really upped the ante in 2020 by using an array of hydraulic jacks to actually walk a historic school to the other side of the block, uh, winning the prestigious On Structures Award for closest thing to Howl's Moving Castle. Before I wrap up, let's all take a moment to, to breathe. Uh, think about the fact that Studio Ghibli's display of the tower, its junky nature, probably has more to do with narrative significance than an astute design choice. The shedding of Howell's burden of responsibility and the freedom that follows is intended to mirror the trajectory of his castle, and as much as our investigation has been a plausibility of the design, at the end of the day, it's all just in good fun. So, having watched this video, are you more or less interested in trying to move your whole house? <laughs> Who am I kidding? Uh, no one owns a house. But I do hope that if you've stuck around this far, that you've enjoyed the whimsical conversation. If you have some thoughts on anything I said or didn't say, uh, leave it down in the comments. I do try to answer most of them. So, as always, uh, thanks for watching, and adios.